Um, I am Sivrin. Last year I presented the stuff I would be doing my promotion in. As of last April, I am actually promoted, so I'm now a doctor. Very happy with that. Also, since March, I've been working at the Blender Institute itself, which I think is really awesome. Yeah! Uh, doing both Blender and Blender Cloud development. And uh, I have commit rights since 2014. And the oldest thing I could find with a date on it was my developer.blender.org account, which shows that I've been nagging fellow developers about things not working since 2004. So two things. Interrupt me. This is not a talk. This is a workshop. I'm very interested in, in learning what you guys think of what I say or questions that you have. Sorry? No? Do you want to have a chair? There you go. Yeah. And ask stupid questions. So to give a, a very rough outline, um, we're going to talk about the work environment and project structure, best behavior of your add-on, and some common it falls. So as for work environment, I think pretty much any of you know and have used at some point at least develop. Who is a developer? Who is developing stuff, add-ons, Python code? Oh, that's awesome. Hmm? No, no, no. Um, PyCharm and PyDev are like higher level, more complex IDEs, which are both really powerful. Atom Sublime are text editors with also some powerful features. Fim and Emacs, you get into the older stuff. <laughs> My desktop, just for people that are interested, I run Kubuntu Linux. I use Zet Shell as my shell. I use command line a lot. I use Atom PyCharm, the community edition, because the pro edition is really powerful, but also not open source, so I'm not using it. Community edition is fine. And Qt Creator for, for C and C++ development. And of course, every once in a while, I still use the Blender text editor, even though it's quite simple. It is integrated in Blender and just gives you a very quick turnaround. So I'm pretty sure that when, when you guys start working on some Blender code, you, you look up a tutorial, maybe you, if you don't type it into the Python text editor itself, you get these red squigglies. Who of you have seen the red squigglies? Oh god, yeah, exactly, <coughs> loads of people. So there's one thing I want to talk about. You, you can rebuild Blender as a module. Who has done, who has tried it? One, two, three, nobody, four. Who has succeeded? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. It's, it's not that difficult. You, you, if you use CMake, you first do it normally, you get a build of Blender, then you edit your CMake cached up text with Python module boolus on, make and make install, and then you have a Python module but it's still somewhere installed in your Blender directory and not necessarily where Python can find it. <coughs> so what I use is virtual env, which creates a virtual environment for your Python. You don't need to be system operator to modify your Python install then. These, uh, these two lines, these two symbolic links, you know, look them up if you ever want to try this because if you do that, and then of course you have to Change workspace, Blender Git, build Pi's your building directory, Blender is your source directory. Modify it for your own system. But if you do this, then you can just start Python, import bpy, and instead of quitting Python the normal way, you can use a Blender operator for it. If you do this, and then you configure your IDE to use that virtual environment, which pretty much anyone of them can, you get rid of the red squigglies, you get code completion, and it all works a lot nicer. So this is something I would really recommend as a, as a setup. Now for project structure, how many of you have written add-ons as a, as a single file? Oh, that's nice. 
I would say make it a Python project. Who of you have made an add-on as a full Python project? Awesome, cool. So this would be what I consider to be a fully Python project with a readme and a setup of Py that creates your package, package name with an init Py, submodules, and even unit tests in there. This is a that's a nice reference. Um, I've heard like somebody complaining about how, that it was difficult to create. What else? No. Never mind. Who uses version control for their add-ons? Git? Few. Uh, Subversion? Few. CVS? <laughs> Good. Anybody problems with where the files are? I've, I've seen descriptions of where to well, they're where you want them to be. I've, I've had questions. People ask me, though, where do I put the files? I see the tutorial about the add-on, how to create it. Where do I put it? Well, you can just make Blender find them. You can put them anywhere you want with some symlinks. <laughs> yeah. So about... I'm racing through them, by the way, so if you have any questions about this, of what it means or anything, just raise your hand, let me know, or is this all known to you guys? Yeah, a lot of nods. One question, yeah. What is a symlink? It's a good question. It is a, 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 like a pointer on your file system. So it's a, it is like a directory that is not really a directory but just pointing to another place on your system. So you can have a symlink called Blender Cloud add-on right here in this directory. That points to your working copy of the Blender Cloud add-on. I'm not developing my add-ons in .config Blender 278 scripts add-ons. I'm putting there somewhere nice in a workspace some are directly in my workspace, like C workspace. Some, or like, if I were to use, to use Windows like that. Some are in home workspace cloud for all my cloud stuff. So there, I separate them out in different rougher structures. But Blender wants to have them in one directory, that is scripts slash add-ons. So I can make links from that one directory into all these other places on my machine where I have these add-ons. And Blender can still find them. And at the same time, I have all my code in the place where I want it. So both Blender and me are happy. Does that, yeah? To repeat, uh, th would there be an option for Blender to create those symlinks for you, effectively? Yeah, when, you, when you say import new plugin from files, a little checkbox is somewhere which says create symlink to copy it in. Because then the developers would be given the hassle of explaining this. Sorry, I'm. <laughs> <laughs> um, the short answer is yes, of course, it can be added. Um, yes, I have commit rights. Uh, and you, you can feel this coming, there's a big but. I think that it's mainly useful for developers because they know what is going on. They, they might know what a symlink is, um, so they could understand it, but as a developer, it's easy enough to make that symlink yourself. Whereas other non-developer users will just get confused by that checkbox and then they check it, it still works, so they think it's good, then they delete their downloads directory because their hard disk is getting full and all of a sudden things stop working. So I don't think it's a really good idea for in general. But uh, doesn't the, when you install from file an add-on, it's, it's a zip file and you, it extracts the, the zip file, right? Yes. How can you symlink uh, the zip file? That, that wouldn't work, I think. I mean, the, the Yeah, that's right. Good point. The thing he said about symlinks because of the zip thing. Yeah, that's a very good point. And I would argue that 
unless the add-on is very small, it's a good idea to split it up into multiple files anyway and to have a proper Python package structure. So you, I would recommend distributing it as a zip. So yeah, that's a problem. So getting started with your add-on, there's many examples. Uh, if you go in the Python text, uh, the Blender text editor, templates, Python, simple add-on, so, sorry, simple operator, you get this. And this is something that is quite important. You see a certain structure. You see the simple operator class, which is the operator itself. It's the thing that you bind to a menu or a button. And then there is a main function that gets called from that operator. So that's something I would recommend to do to have your functionality in regular Python functions. And then have that operator call into those Python functions to do their work. I've had many questions of people asking, how do you get an operator to run several operators after each other? Like one starts, uh, so I would say don't, just create an operator that calls the right functions. If you follow the structure that's given to you by, the, by Blender itself, you would get this. But. So then you have turning your package into an add-on. You just paste the BL info at the top and you're done. Um, one thing to know is um, that it's not executed. To keep things fast, only the first bit of the file is parsed, and Blender just looks at the structure of the code, so you can't do any fancy stuff in here. That's something that uh, I ran into at some point. I wanted to have the version of the module def defined at one central spot. I don't want to copy things all over again but that doesn't work. You can't put uh, a variable here that you get from something else because the, it's not executed. So now we get to the more interesting bits, the, the behavior of the, of the add-on. Ah, I'll skip this, you guys know about naming. Reloading with a fade. How many people have made their add-on specifically to, to be able to reload with a fade? Yeah, a few, that's nice. <laughs> I also saw some people shaking no, which is also good. So what happens if you press F8? It calls unregister on your add-on, it reloads all the Blender loaded modules from your disk, and then it executes the, the module's code. It calls registers again. So this is what happens with F8, and the trick is that it reloads only the modules that Blender loaded. So then you have a thing, the code on disk is not the module in memory. I will skip this. You guys are more, more advanced than the questions I got before, so that's, that's interesting. So who, you know this stuff? You've seen it? You No? Good, good, good. Um, this is often at the top of the top level module of an add-on. And this is what allows F8 to do its work. And this hooks into why, how, how Blender works. Locals is a function that returns a dictionary of all the local variables. And if you say import bpy, which is below that, bpy becomes a local name with that it's really, uh, points to the bpy module. So if bpy is in locals, that means that the code there <laughs> is already run. It's on top and it executed just goes down. So how is that possible? Well, that happens if you reload. Everything in memory, all the, the entire module, it just stays in memory. And that bpy name just exists. So if it exists in locals, that means that you're reloading, you can reload something, a submodule. And I just copied this code from the Bolt Factory add-on. So if we can reload it, we can tell Python to reload the submodule. And otherwise, we're running for the first time. And then you just import that submodule as, as normal. Maybe an important point to precise is that 
you can call import on a module several times, but it will only be evaluated the first time. That's why you have to use reload afterwards, because you can import Bolt Factory two times, and you you will the second call will just do nothing but return the the module already in memory. Thank you very much, Bachian. Yeah. So this is something that I also got quite a few questions about. How do you know what's happening in your code? So, show of hands, who used print statements? <laughs> yes. Awesome. Self report. I put it in there as well because it is um, also a very important function to use, and it's also for telling the user what is going on. Error messages, info messages, warnings, that kind of stuff. I won't go into details about this because it's um, not really for developers. It's uh, for telling your users what is going on. So we have print statements, but another one is remote debugging. Who has used remote debugging? One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, that's good. Who has tried remote bug debugging and failed? Yeah, one, two, three, excellent. And there is a logging module. Uh, it's um, a basic Python module. I think it's brilliant. I think more add-ons should be using it, so we'll get a, have a quick look at that as well. So print statements are, as you can see, everybody used them. It's, it's very simple to use. It's well known. But the problem is that you have to remove it again. It's for just debugging. You add a print statement. You see that the code executes. Then you have to remember to remove it all before you commit the code. Otherwise, the user gets all these prints and gets a wall of text in their console. There's also no metadata. You don't know where the print is, so you have to type that yourself. Uh, you don't get timestamps, so if you have a longer running thing, you don't know anything about the performance or whatnot. If you see a screenshot from a user that says, well, Blender says this on the console, you have no idea from where that was or what the performance was or anything. You don't have severity levels, like this is a debug message or it's an error or it's a warning. And there is no user control. And it's also a question that I've seen quite a few times on Stack Overflow, etc., asking, guys, Blender is outputting all this information. I don't want to see it. How do I remove it? I said, well, yeah, sorry, you, you can't without editing the code. So another way to figure out what is going on is remote debugging. And remote, might, you might think that it's about a different machine, that you have a debugger on one machine and you code on a different one. But it's actually, you can use it on the same computer. But have Blender running and have your debugger running and have one connect to the other. So it's more remoting between applications than between computers. With remote debugging, you get really detailed info about your code flow, about the state. You can set breakpoints, and then when it hits, Blender will just stop, and your debugger will pop up. You can step through it. You can see everything. It doesn't require any additional code, so you don't have to remember that you have to remove stuff. And your breakpoints can be really smart. I've been using um, PyCharm now for a while. And it really has some cool breakpoints. Like you set a breakpoint here that shouldn't do anything, and then a breakpoint there that should only hit if that breakpoint was hit. So it doesn't do anything, it does register that it was hit. So in this very common bit of code, you can break only if that special case was hit before. That kind of advanced stuff, I think, is really powerful. Still, you have little metadata, so you don't have any timestamps or se severity level. It doesn't really matter that much, usually, when you're doing this kind of debugging. And it requires IDE support. It, it requires configuration. It, it's quite tricky to set up. And it's only for developers. And I know at least somebody who was asking about how to set this all up. So I did that last night. I started with sudo apt-get install eclipse pydev because pydev is also a really nice, powerful uh, development environment. I mentioned PyCharm. 
I used it before, but the remote debugging features are only pro. It's closed source, so I can't say that it's good to use here at the Blender conference. So I wanted to go full open source route, just app get install Eclipse PyDev, then install my add-on and configure it and everything, but it didn't work. So oh, just download it and install it from there, and then install PyDev from the other URL, and then you get the latest version, and that does work. I've made an add-on on GitHub. Uh, I might include it in the uh, Blender add-ons or an add-on contrib. Um, you have to configure it for PyCharm or PyDev. Somewhere you'll find a path on your machine. I had to look really hard because nobody tells you where it is. But it's somewhere along those lines. It, I searched for, I don't know, 15 minutes to find the thing. This is PyDev with the code loaded of the actual add-on for remote debugging that I was adding. And you have to click on that little thingy. Then choose the debug perspective. And click on that little thingy. That will start the debug server. And it's really specific, tiny little thingies that you have to find. But this starts the whole thing. You will get a message. I didn't screenshot that about a port number. I hard coded that port number in the add on, hoping that it's always the same. I don't know. If it doesn't work, let me know. This is the add on. You activate it. And this here you see the, the full path of the thing. So in your system, you go to a home. Your username, p2, yada, 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 pydevd.py. The pydevd.py is the thing that you have to point Blender to. If you've done that, you press space, search for pydev, hit enter. It connects to the debugger. You can set a breakpoint. At this point, I set it to the unregistered function because at the time it was past midnight last night. And I just wanted to have one function that was easy to call. So I set a breakpoint there. You hit F8, it stops. How many of you have experience with this kind of debugging? Uh, not so many. Do you guys want me to sh talk through what is here on the screen and what it can give you? All right, then I will go and, yeah, that's because I have to point a lot. So what you see here is the code. And there's a little green dot over there. That's my breakpoint. I just double clicked in the margin. And it sets a breakpoint. As soon as your code reaches that point, it will pause. And Blender will lock up. It will no longer refresh. It will no longer respond to anything. Don't panic. That's what breakpoints are for. So the line is green to tell you that that is where the execution halted. And then here you see what was loaded, what is currently executing. So there's some string module that's in Blender. And then we have a load script function in some initPy. We have a disable function in add-on utils. So Pi apparently Blender calls disable on the add-ons when you press F8. And that then calls our unregister function in remote debugger.py. So this is very useful if you want to answer the question, what is my code running? What is it doing? Especially when you have uh, a common function that can be called from 100 different locations. This will tell you, tell you where it was called from. And then here you have all the global variables, local variables. You can really inspect and drill through to the state of all your code. And here is the console output of Blender. Um, there's buttons over here that you can use to step over a function, execute it, or step into a function, and execute it bit by bit. So it really helps in, in stepping through the code, seeing what's going on. Is that a bit clear? I hope. Yeah? Good. No? <laughs>
So th this was my. I can turn this off. This was my commit from last night because Vibren at the at the dinner said he really wanted to hear about this, and other people also wanted to hear about this. So there you go. And then we come round to the logging module. Who has read my code.blog.org article about this? Um, not bad. One thing I really like about log, well, everything I like about the logging module, but one thing is really important that is it can be left in the code. By default, only the warning and error messages are shown to the user. So if you log at debug or info, you can just leave it in, it's all fine. Um, string formatting of that message is only done if the message is actually logged, so it also doesn't bog down your code that much. There's metadata available, you have timestamps, you have severity levels, uh, where it is in the code, which module, and it is under the user's control, and I think this is the most important bit. Anybody can configure their Blender if they know how, but in a while you will know how. They can configure their Blender to see those specific messages from those specific modules that they're interested in and play with that to, to get the info you need. It's slightly more complex than print, so I'm sorry about that. You have to import an extra module. You have to do some configuration. But I don't see a really a downside to using a login module apart from that. So this is an example. So instead of using print, I make a logger. I just say in my class log equals logging dot get logger, and then I think it's useful for operators to use bpy dot ops dot their name. So this lo these loggers are hierarchical. So you can say all the bpy, I want to only see errors, no warnings, no nothing. That then works for bpy.ops, it works for bpy.anything because it's a hierarchy of dotted notation just like the Python modules. So I'm, I'm still not entirely sure what to put that, what to put there, but maybe we can have a little bit of a discussion about that once uh, I'm done explaining about this logging module. So once I have that logging ob object, that logger, I can call self.log.info.error.warning um, and it will just put that into the logger system. So we have an info, we have a warning, and we have a debug showing here. Default behavior is that it will say no active object, not doing anything. So that was that warning that we had there. And the rest is just not shown. We can leave it in the code. It's useful for developers. It's not shown by default, so regular users won't even see it. The way I like it is showing info or higher, debugger for selected stuff that I'm actually working on, and showing, uh, I'm, and I'm being a little bit inconsistent here, sorry, showing only the time because the date I know it's today, I'm working on my own stuff. Um, so here you see that you have a nice overview of what's going on, the severity of everything. So how do you configure it? I've, and I've had a discussion with this about Campbell. I, I said Blender should be configured to log nicely. I think this is nice, this is not, because it doesn't even tell you whether it's an error or a warning, and I think that's an important difference. But Campbell said, no, we're not going to do that because Python has a certain default. Blender should just use Python as default as it is. If you want to change Python's default, go talk to Guido van Rossum or something. And yeah, I actually agree with him. He said you have to follow Python tutorials. You should be able to just get a Python book somewhere, use it with Blender, get the same output as they show you in the book. I think it's, it's very good reasoning. So you can just put anything, like you can in your OS specific prefix, you can script, startup, put any Blender fi uh, Python file in there, it will get executed at um, Blender startup. So I made a config logging.py in which you put this. 
I th at first I thought it was a bit scary looking. Um, version one is something that you always have to put in so that the logger knows that you're serious. <laughs> <laughs> then you get the formatters, which is cool because you can say I want to have the ASCII time. That's not minus 15 seconds. It's a string of 15 characters. And I always forget what plus and minus is. One aligns to the left, the other to the right. I never know which, but this one works. Level name is debug or info or that kind of stuff. And then you get the name of the logger and the actual log message. And this way you can just configure yourself how you want to have it. Then you can give it handlers, and these are really powerful. For me, while debugging my own stuff, I just want to see it on console. I want to see standard error, standard out, something like that. But if you have a, a bigger environment with multiple blenders running and you want to know from all of them what they're doing, you can actually send this through a network connection to a central machine that listens to all these log messages and then can also log the host name of the machine it was running on. So you can create this lovely output of what all your machines are doing. And I think then you really lift it to another level that you can't get with print statements. Before, you could ev do everything with print statements. You could write your own name in there. You could explicitly say if it's a warning or an error. You could even put the time in there. But then to send it through a network, that's something else. You can also let it write to a file that gets gzipped automatically at the end of the day and then moved aside and then it keeps them for like seven days and then deletes the old stuff. That's all given for free in these logger uh, code. Then you have the loggers that, well, this configuration for logger specific stuff. So operators are debug and Blender ID is debug because I'm working on it. Um, and stuff that isn't configured gets to the full pointing level. Any questions about this kind of stuff? Who is now going to use logging? Awesome. Really cool, really cool. Um, so one thing I want to talk with you about is this, this bit. You, often you see the module. So if I'm in the Blender Cloud dot something dot something else module, I would say Blender Cloud dot something dot something else, or simply underscore underscore name underscore underscore. But Operators are re like important and injected into this to this bpy.ops namespace, so it might also be nice to log them there. But does anybody have an opinion on that? What would you love to see in Blender? Well, I'd like to see the logging integrated um, perfectly, because with respect, I disagree with Campbell Barton and your agreement with him. It, when I power up the Python um, console in Bender, mm -hmm. the opening lines say, we've already imported the following modules, the following convenience um, variables are available for you, bpy.context as capital C. I know in advance that's not a plain Python environment. What's wrong with just adding another line that says logging configured? Access it with this convenience if you want. Just as that heads up, yeah. that it's not a pure vanilla um, um, Python. One, I, th I think it's a very good point. Um, one big difference is that the things that you see printed there that are not vanilla Python are only for that console where you see that message. And the logging module is global. So it, if you change that configuration, it goes for everything that you import, every add-on, every built-in Blender stuff. So that's the difference. You might use it without seeing that message. Does that change your opinion? No. <laughs> I agree that is a risk, but yeah. the impact of that risk I think is quite small, and I think the benefits of having logging switched on by default yeah. outweigh that, uh, that risk. So would you agree with me that this is nice, or would you 
because what I've done here is created a nice example that aligns this all nicely and that minus 15 up there that is because my module names are not that long so everything is within that 15 characters it all lines out nicely so actually I'm I'm not fussy you know the benefits of having logging will outweigh oh no my module is 20 characters long it won't fit it's the end of the world I mean, oh come on get over yourself um, <laughs> <laughs> no um, I'll, I'll take logging I'll take it however you give it to me cool thanks because even though I agree with uh, Campbell that is very good like his points are very good uh, I also agree with you and I would seem love to see more logging in uh, in our add-ons. Yes. So uh, maybe you 15 characters gonna be the last one because there is the name of my model. Sorry, say, can you say it again? When you in the format you trim the the name. Well, fortunately, it's not trimmed. Oh, so it's that not trimmed. it's oh. just the default space that it gives it. So. Um, I'm actually full of myself and talking nonsense because the name itself isn't trimmed or isn't doesn't have a width. But I do play with that because I want to visually separate the name of the thing that's logging from the message itself and have all the messages in a nice column. So I often do change that. Um, Does logging have a runtime cost even when enabled or when not enabled? Since it's a global thing, will it influence the runtime of a script? Um, no, I don't think so. Maybe a little bit, but the, um, the formatter, I think, runs after the handler. So if the handler decides that it shouldn't be logged anywhere, the formatting doesn't run. Um, also, you can ask a logger whether it's dis enabled for a certain, uh, certain level. So if I'm want really going deep with the debugging with the loggers, I sometimes want to log a lot more info that takes time to, to gather. So what I do is if self.log. is enabled for debug, then do all the complex debugging stuff. So you can avoid that runtime overhead. Of course the if also takes its time, so if it's really <coughs> sensitive, yeah, but yeah. One um, thing I would quite like, I don't, yeah. When you pull down the file menu, you get the list of operations that have just happened, the logging within Blender's interface, mm -hmm. um, where it tells you what operators have happened, all that stuff. Yeah. If there was a logger built into um, into Blender, one of the, lo uh, the logging um, output stream types or whatever it is, that would output your log data to there. I think that's a very good idea. Th then I think a lot of people would be persuaded to start using logging just for that convenience. Yeah. Um, having it go to the console for standard out is fine, um, but if there was a way to do that, that'd be awesome. I think it would also make logging a uh, logging lot more useful for regular users. Because if you start Blender with a desktop icon and you're not on Windows, you can't even show your console. And I think it's a good idea. And you can create your own logging classes, because this is just a stream handler that outputs to some stream. But you can also make a Blender handler that puts them all in there. Another advantage, by the way, that I'm just thinking of, I didn't put it in here, but it's uh, I believe it's thread safe. So you can, in different threads, do logging, and then it won't be a big jumble when it comes out. Uh, so I think logging is super important, and well-designed logging is important for applications to help avoid debugging, help users, and all that stuff. Uh, but one thing I wanted to add is that if you don't want to add a default for all Python for the logging, which I think is quite reasonable, another approach you could take is to offer a utility module or function inside the Blender um, modules where you just say get logger with this name, but it's bpy.utils.getlogger. And then if you encourage a lot of the 
uh, module or, or add-on developers who don't want to actually spend all this time carefully configuring a logger, which let's face it, most don't, uh, then they'll just get some default logger that includes the name, the time, and all that stuff. And I think that might be a nice way to sidestep the issue of changing the defaults while also providing an easy path to encourage more module writers to, to do that. So effectively, if I understand right, you would say uh, configure logging, but leave the defaults in, but create some sub logger, say bpy here, that has its own formatter. And then everything you log to bpy.something gets that default formatting. That might be interesting. But I think we might even, with your idea of letting it show in the user interface, we might have nicer. Not, yeah. uh, about your idea to show in the interface, uh, some time ago I, I won an interactive console for the game engine and found a console grouted in bitmap fonts, you know? Yeah. But recently I discovered there is a post draw function in the viewport. And you can write directly with with BGL, and yeah. I have my interactive console for the game engine in the runtime. But that this guy say is possible with the BGL in the viewport. So you would have logging at real time drawn on yeah. top of your viewport, like in, in the 3D view. In, yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, I problem. wouldn't. I wouldn't do it by default. But I think once we have that framework for logging set up and something that can receive those log entries in, in uh, our Blender code. Somebody could write an add-on that does that, and if you like it, you can enable it. Yeah. Yeah, it might be interesting. So I don't hear anybody saying anything about, uh, where is it? This name. Should it be the module name that the operator is in, or should it be the name of the operator as you can call it? I just say it's up to the developer to choose. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I couldn't choose, so now I put this in, but I'm very inconsistent because I still can't choose. <laughs> <laughs> so let's move on to the third bit, some common pitfalls. Comments, please, please document why your code is doing something. What and how is it, should be clear in the code? I think there's one exception or uh, one big thing that doc strings, like the documentation that belongs to a function, should describe what it does. For me, it's the first thing I write. I create a function, I create this doc string, and I explain what it should do. I see a lot of people nodding yes. Who, do, who does that? Who starts with the documentation? <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> For me, I, I know I can be chaotic. I know I can lose my head in, in the thing that I'm working on. And it helps so much to have that little description to it that says this function does that. If I'm doing something else, I know it should be in a different function. I don't care about performance laws of doing another function call. It's Python anyway. It's not that fast anyway. So I just, it, it scopes my mind, so to speak. I saw a hand raised there. Yeah. So, in my day job, I work with legacy code, and we all hope that our add-on lives forever and one thing about documentation if you change the code not always the documentation above the method changes so yeah the other thinking is the real uh, the code speaks for itself so uh, you c we can read code so we can uh, the code should be uh, structured in a way that it's easy to read and we, then we know what this method does. I think um, uh, what 
I did with my add-on, the more important stuff is the user documentation that the user knows how to use it and then uh, they can use it and I th think some plugins are really good or add-ons. <laughs> But uh, the user documentation, not so. That's my point oh, about absolutely. documentation. But that very much, I think, depends on the the goal of your add-on. Um, but I think like I wrote a huge add-on for my PhD work with crowd simulation and everything, and five different ways of the crowd simulation, four and a half of which were wrong because that's what you do when you research stuff. The documenting why something is done, I think it's always important. For other developers, and that includes you in two weeks, or maybe even you after having that good night's rest, you have a different mindset. <laughs> yeah. Question. Does uh, unit testing exist in Python? Does unit testing exist in Python? Yes, it does. Um, it's a very good one, and I really like unit testing. It's also something that can be tricky with Blender, especially when you can't import BPI from without Blender. Um, so what I sometimes do is separate my code into bits. One bit is Blender specific, imports BPI, does all the Blender stuff. One, code, one part of the code is not Blender specific and won't load BPI, won't load back into the Blender specific stuff. And then you can just import it from a unit test and do everything. There are different unit test runners. Uh, Py.test is at the moment my favorite. It also has plugins to measure um, things like uh, code coverage. So you can see that file line, that through that, that through that, that through that is covered. IDEs have support for it as well. So I can just right click, run this test with coverage and then the IDE will highlight which lines were hit by the test and which weren't. So there's quite a lot of unit testing stuff available for Python. And if you build Python as a module, then you can even unit test your, Python, your Blender stuff. But I, I must say I haven't, haven't done that. This one hit me. <laughs> and it hit me in a weird way. My last name is Stufel with an umlaut on the U. And that creates all kinds of funny errors. So from the start of internet related stuff, different computers talking to each other, I've been blessed with, I think my list, I can look it up later, is about 24 different ways long. like. 24 different ways of spelling my name wrong. It's pretty much all character encoding issues. But my favorite error message was your na invalid name, each name has to contain at least one alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> so you can imagine that when I, was, I, I test a lot with Unicode stuff, I love to go to Wikipedia, go to uh, a Teddy to Thai, look up some nice recipes, copy paste Thai or Burmese or whatnot into unit tests or, or into the interface to test with. And this one hit me as a unit test, uh, as a um, Unicode issue because ASCII was doing fine and then Unicode was all garbled and mesh messed up. Blender didn't, didn't crash and back then this bit will misbehave was not in the documentation. So I thought, well, it doesn't crash, so I'm not being hit by this. Well, I was, so I changed the manual to include the misbehaving. <laughs> the thing is that Python works differently with certain short ASCII strings, things that are really common, like the, or I don't know what they include there, but really short stuff doesn't get deleted from memory because you use it so often it's fine, it keeps it in memory, but more complex stuff, it is deleted. So then it uh, went wrong. So in the end, I did this. I created a decorator, which is a kind of a wrapper function around your function. And what it does here, 
It calls the wrap function with certain parameters. It stores it in the result, and finally, in the end, before it returns, it will store it in a property on the wrap function itself. So as long as that function that should return the enum items lives, the last result that it returned will live in Python's memory. I start with result equals none. So if this fails for some reason, uh, exception, then the last result is just set to none. So it does clear the memory if it turns out not to be possible to return anything. And this works. This works pretty nicely. Does anyone see a problem with this? I'm, I, I'm not sure, but I'm wondering if, I mean, how could you, um, if your function is called several times in, a, in an enum property, for example, for each eight items, how come it doesn't return in the end always uh, the result of the last call only for all the, um, mm. because you are catching only the last, the result of the last call. Yeah, so you mean you have many enum properties yeah. that all call into the same yeah. callback. Yeah. Or even in the same property, if you are... Um, I know I had that, that, that famous bug when I was using a function to generate the... Um, I don't remember if it was the name of whatever, of um, a set of enum pro, uh, values. Yeah. And if you are using the same function to generate mm, some text for each values of that enum, I wonder, wouldn't it only re return the last um, the last result here? It always returns what the function returns. So it always yeah, but calls, but it only caches the, yeah, the, the last, last call. Last so call. all the other calls are no more cached. True. So you'll hit again the problem. Yeah. I think, I, I'm not sure it has yeah. to be tested, but... Uh, so we could, we could ma add another function outside of this to make it a. Um, a now I forgot well, name. You you need some kind of dictionary but or something. You would, yeah, we would. You would have to pass a key yeah. into it, but becomes tricky. Can we make just Blender remember it, and do it properly? I don't know. <laughs> 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 I'll find that can't answer. Oh yeah. So yeah, no, that's uh, that's a downside. I didn't think of that. For my case, it worked because I only have one, one callback call, for yes. one enum property. Uh, by the way, this was in the uh, attract uh, extension of the Blender Cloud add-on. You have to. Uh, it has a list of projects that you have available, and that was where it went wrong. Well, there's only one attract for us anyway, with one list of projects, so it worked fine. But yeah, that's a good point. So that means it doesn't get into Blender as a fix yet. Probably not. <laughs> no, because then you need you you need to keep the warning because the enum property still has the same, and you can't really provide a good solution. Who knows this one? Functions should have only one return point. Who has heard of this? Who agrees with it? But why? <laughs> why? Less confusion. Why? Less less confusion is the the answer. But yeah, please give him the microphone because I, I want to I want to know why. Well, um, why? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I would say could be confusing to have like a mysteries of. Uh, if in and else if to have many returns, I guess so you're better. I don't know. Okay. Put the result in a variable and time return is flying. Okay. So we have six minutes left. I love your answer. So I want to move to this um, common approach. If it's good, then we do it. Sounds good on the surface. I don't agree. I say. If it's bad, you abort. <laughs> it sounds more and more... Uh, anyway, so this is an example. We have a special snowflake multiplication. It's very special. 
The first parameter must be a non-zero integer. The second must be a positive float, and it returns our magic number. And otherwise, it fails. So we do the, if it's good, then we do it approach. If parameter 1 is not 0, and parameter 2 is bigger than 0, we return our magic snowflake. There it is. Otherwise, we have to raise a value error because something was wrong, and otherwise we have to raise another value error because something else was wrong. And this is very, very common. But I don't like it. I, I say nay. <laughs> nay. Yeah. If it's bad, thank you, thank you, yeah. If it's bad, stop. Yeah. In any case, yeah. yeah. In any case, this is correct. Yeah. And I like this so much because if you have yet another thing that you have to check, uh, the network is still up. Special, special snowflake. What happens here is that you just push that thing that does the actual work, you push it down. It can be easily found here at the bottom, and it just pushes down. Whereas here, this would indent even more. You would have a git diff that shows that uh, the thing that does the actual work has changed, whereas it didn't. It just needed an extra test. With this, you see in your diff that you added an extra test, and that's it. So do you still think that it's a good idea to have one return point, or well, not? In this case, yeah. Well, in this case, you have one return, but I, this, this is kind of return. You could see return minus one or return minus one here. If you're in a more C style, you return error codes as well. Uh, also nested loops. Hmm? Exiting out of nested loops. Exiting out of nested loops, yeah. In, in if you make it a function, you can just return, yeah. Uh, if you use generators, you can often just avoid having a nested loop altogether, at least in, in the main thing that has to do the thing. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. <laughs> this is also something I've seen so many times, and it's just, just do that. Like, this is a thing, an expression that returns true or false. So if it, the thing that returns true or false is true, we return true. And if the thing that returns true or false returns false, we return false. Uh, so just, uh, just do this. Um, I think we're, yeah. So this one I want to give you, yeah. Sorry, can I, um, go back to your... Sorry, go back to that, right. Go back to the previous one. Yeah. That is more amenable to adding debugging or adding comments or adding alternative actions that need to happen, which will then appear in the right place in your diff. So actually, there are some times when that is the right thing to do. True, I don't completely agree yet, because always doing this, because at some future you might want to add something that might be a bit clearer then. I would say if you need it, just rewrite it to this. Until then, just do that, I would say. Uh, because it's so much harder, so much much easier to read. This one is a must read for every Python programmer. It's funny, it's a shitload of, of anti-patterns. It, it's easy to read, it's just, it's just hilarious. I think we're running out of time, but Andrew, don't do this. <laughs> the problem with putting your data in the add-on is that if you upgrade your Blender to two, from, say, 277 to 278, everything is copied, so then you have a two gigabyte add-on. If you then upgrade to 279, you have a three gigabyte add-on. Yeah. So instead, call this function, give it the cache parameter to give you the nice system-specific cache directory. When I implement t something something, until that time, there is that app dearest.py that can give you a very nice alternative. I use this also in the Blender Cloud add-on to put temporary files that you download in there. And one last thing that x plus equals y is not the same as x equals x plus y. It's often described, yeah, it's just a shorthand. 
for the few people that don't are not programmers, x plus equals y means increment x with y. And the other one means compute the sum of x and y and assign it to x. Now, for numbers, it's exactly the same thing. But if you're talking about lists, for example, the first one will append y to the list, will compute the, the union if x and y are both lists. The list of y is added to x and it becomes a larger list. The second one computes a new list, so the original x and the original y are not modified. And then that new list is assigned to the name x modified. And then that new list is assigned to the name x. In a more complex situation where x may be a parameter that you get from a function, and the new x is something that you return, the first one would modify your, it, the input. And the second one would just generate a new output without modifying its input. So it's a very big difference. And we've argued on IRC with developers who try to do cleanup of Python code and change the button to the top and then things break. So, so please know the difference. So to look back, we created work environment, we created add-ons, and didn't look at naming classes because you guys know we look at mostly at logging and returning and that other silly things. So thank you very much.